Swinburne University of Technology. Uh, hello. Uh, number 11, the sociology of uh, healthcare. Um, illness, uh, health and illness are, 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 I suppose, are particularly interesting for all of us because um, they're going to culminate in our death um, eventually. Um, and sociology has a particular interest um, in in health uh, and in illness, um, and there are a few a few a few aspects that you you may not be familiar with in terms of well not not so much that you won't be familiar with, but but there are some challenging aspects of of the the sociological um, interpretation of of health and illness, and and maybe the obvious one is the 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 link between life chances in terms of um, health and illness and um, where you were born, where you were born in terms of um, socioeconomic status and where you were born in terms of um, uh, well, uh, demographics, whether you're sort of inside or outside uh, a major city and then in terms of um, uh, your ethnicity. Um, uh, so if, if you think of um, white, middle class, Anglo, Celtic man or woman in Australia compared with a, um, an indigenous person living outside a, a mainstream centre. You, you might start to see how these social factors are, are uh, particularly important, fundamentally important to, to your life chances and, and your ability to, to live a full, satisfying, rich life not impeded by, by health and illness. I suppose the other thing is the whole notion of, of sickness as a social construction as well, um, which I'll talk about as well, that, that illness um, is a social construction, that it's not simply a, a biological fact of, you know, germ passes by, you sniff it, and you become sick, you take some medicine, you get better, you go yeah, back to work or about your life. Um, so uh, firstly, l looking at the idea, um, looking at the idea of um, socioeconomic status, there, there, there are many studies that uh, you'll come across, there are many studies in, in the book that, that talk about your um, um, your life chances in relation to your socioeconomic status. If we have have a quick look at uh, the Australian experience um, with um, one of one of the most fundamental elements, I suppose, is that that we come across every day is obesity, um, and obesity is is certainly a, a result of of the ch two things. I would argue one, the change in our, our economic status, our, our financial status, and two, a change in um, our, our cultural understanding of uh, about food in particular and and then its consequences in health health and illness um, I suppose the other one is uh, the other area that you can you can look at and as a, a consequence of, of obesity is diabetes um, um, and or a consequence of diet and so it doesn't necessarily follow that the, that obesity leads to to diabetes it, it can be you can not be obese, but due to poor diet over a protracted period of time, um, become diabetic as well. And, and in the indigenous population, diabetes and kidney failure are at, at levels that are inconceivable in the, the white Australian population. Um, partly to do with diet, partly to do with I isolation, uh, and then partly to do, to do with income. Um, all of them explicable in, 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 in sort of social uh, uh, socio-economic, um, political economic terms. Uh, these, all of these things can be explained in that context. The cultural aspect of, of the consumption of, of food and our expectations about food is, is also in interesting, an interesting aspect to, to look at as well. A little bit of a tangent from the health and illness, but, but it's, it's very hard uh, today to separate um, the consumption patterns of food and, and the resultant uh, both health benefits but health detriments that, that we're experiencing. Um, um, some would argue that, that, that 
that advertising convenience the speed of life is causing us to change our dietary dietary habits so that that meals aren't made from scratch anymore um, that and and when a meal is made from scratch it's more likely that that a greater variety of ingredients will be used more more time is taken in the preparation and and um, and in the eating of it and um, as a consequence uh, there's there's more time to consider and focus upon what what's being consumed whereas in the the sort of the fast food world the convenience food world um, which part of the argument goes that that life has has either sped up so much for us that that convenience foods are the only appropriate response to be able, uh, being able to get everything done in say a family context and a busy life context uh, plus also advertising um, has also become um, a, a major influencer in in what we consume um, and then the other thing I, I suppose we can have a quick consideration of is, is smoking. Smoking rates are, are certainly going down, um, but smoking rates, if you look at, at the demographics of, of who smokes, uh, you're more likely to smoke uh, if you're um, um, of a lower socioeconomic status than you are of a higher economic status. Health outcomes are much better for people with higher economic sta statuses than lower economic statuses, but it's not necessarily the, the dollars you have to spend. There is, there's a culture of consumption as well. There's an understanding about um, how we consume things and then how we respond to what we consume. So then exercise also come, comes into it as well. Um, so that, that there's, there's a dynamic, a cultural and economic dynamic just in that we can look at in, in the context of our, our immediate world that, um, that implicates health and illness. Then if you, you look at the, the sort of larger factors <coughs> um, in the socioeconomic considerations and that is the, the apportioning of healthcare dollars and the availability of healthcare and the standard, standard and level of healthcare also um, is, is arbitered by socioeconomic status as well. In Australia we have a universal healthcare system uh, called Medicare and that, that gives everybody access to, to uh, first world, um, in some cases, teaching hospitals where the quality of care and the level of care is, is at a very high standard. Uh, it gives us access to doctors and in most cases these days it seems a rebate on the amount we pay to see the doctor rather than the what they used to call the most common fee which is when you go to the doctor you give them a Medicare card and and the visits essentially free um, that happens for certain categories of people but more and more um, we pay the doctor sixty dollars and get thirty dollars back um, um, but then we have a competing parallel system in terms of hospitals which is the private hospital system and the private hospital system is is effectively a user pay system where where we pay medical insurance that that is we pay uh, for protection against the possibility that we may need to use the hospital's facilities and uh, that that insurance payment we make regularly each month each week fortnight or month um, then gives us access to to that system um, that's that's a cost above and beyond what we all contribute um, through our taxes to the Medicare system that, that gives everybody universal access to that system. Um, and uh, the divisions are, are interesting in, in, the, in the apportionment of private, private health, health insurance uh, and we've just been going through the debate uh, at, uh, recently where the government, the, the Howard government introduced a 30% rebate on health insurance, what the, the government were trying to do in terms of, of health care was shift as many people as possible into the private system, possibly for ideological reasons, but certainly they would argue for reasons uh, uh, of the uh, better care and maintenance of the public health care system. If you can take numbers out of the public health care system, uh, money can be focused on that and, and the standards although already high, could, could be increased and then waiting lists could be reduced. People would get access, people who had 
um, non-urgent um, surgical cases, for instance, could get, get access quicker. Unfortunately, it didn't necessarily happen that, that more money immediately went, went into the system and politicians will argue about the relativities of how much money they put in and they'll pay with the figures and all sorts of stuff. But if we, th we think about the, the, um, the private healthcare system, we, we, we inevitably then have to think about the economic system, the, the notion of neoliberalism um, and, and the ideology that the conservative parties have towards provision, um, private for provision for private goods. Uh, uh, are seen as a virtue. Public provision is, is seen as, as, as a safety net, um, but there's, there's a feeling that, that if you can provide for yourself privately, um, you should provide for yourself privately. Um, and there's, there's a national um, appeal um, that that has, but we, if you, we think back to the education um, lecture, um, uh, the nation has always been, up until relatively recently, say the last 20 years, or maybe even the last 10, uh, 15 years, that uh, that we have a we have a very good system. We have a, a medical system and a hospital system that that literally is the envy of the world, um, and that. Uh, it serves it serves our purposes very well. If you choose to opt out of that system, um, then why shouldn't you pay for opting out of a system uh, rather than than then be given a um, a rebate for opting out of that system? We have that rebate system. The Labor government has been trying to introduce a means test on that, uh, suggesting that people that earn over a, a certain income, which is up to twice the average income, uh, probably don't deserve the uh, the uh, the rebate on on their contributions to to private health care um, and that becomes an ideological issue um, it's tied up with notions of middle class welfare um, or upper middle class welfare really this um, at the sort of uh, wage levels we're talking about where where it cuts out um, so you, so just in the provision of health care we can see that it's very hard to separate it from um, uh, from the economic and the political. It has to be said that the, the, the private health and particularly uh, private hospitals are very keen on certain demographics. Um, simple operations like hip replacements, even removals of, of prostates, um, cataract operations, operations that are reasonably simple and straightforward that don't, that don't take a lot of aftercare, that don't require um, ICUs, um, um, intensive care units, um, are the ones that are preferred. Um, younger, robust, reasonably healthy people are certainly also preferred as well. Um, older, more infirm people aren't. And in, in a similar way to, to the way private education provision works, people are, um, uh, the organisations, the institutions are likely to slough off to the public system those which are too costly or, or too difficult. So, so we have sort of a, a moral ethical issue to, to consider there. Part of the argument that the other side would give is that, well, these, these institutions are, are taking the weight off the public system so to the extent that they're choosing what weight they're going to remove is their right so this is going to be riven by politics so understand that that, that it's not a simple matter of those who um, those who choose to or not choose to are, are making an arbitrary choice and that that's all it is in addition we have the the additional life for all those earning over seventy seven thousand dollars a year um, they pay an additional uh, one percent or one and a half percent on their 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 tax over and above the one percent they already pay, so that there is um, um, by the Labor government an acknowledgement that those who are who are earning more money should contribute a greater amount to the the healthcare system. So um, on on the local sort of domestic level, we, we let's think about think about um, healthcare in terms of culture, politics and economics apart from the, the, the pain and suffering and the, the, sort of the biological, if you like. Um, then there are a few other, um, from a sociological, theoretical point of view, um, we bring Talcott Parsons back into it, that um, trusty old conservative from the 50s, the um, 
the functionalist who argues that there is a sick role in society, that, that, that the sick have a role to play in society and, and should and must ad adhere to that. And, and if you have a look at page 741 um, of your, your textbook, the, the four constituents of a, um, a sick role are laid out. Now, the sick role is a responsibility that um, th that we, when we're sick, have, um, and that that we need to adhere to that role to be responsible to the rest of society. Because remember, when we're talking about functionalism, it's reinforcing society's values. So, what what they what Parsons argues, and the the sort of the functionalists argue um, in terms of the sick role is is firstly that illness um, illness suspends. Um, routine responsibilities so that that we understand that if you're ill um, you are allowed to step outside of the the regular routine of work and domestic responsibilities and and even social responsibilities now that that's a given um, the second the second response is though um, is to to make sure that we understand that illness is not deliberate we don't undertake to get sick uh, generally um, so that um, people shouldn't be made responsible for their illness but and this is the the the, the two other points then come in uh, with the, the sort of the responsibility part of it that that we do have a responsibility to to get well we we have to make every effort um, not to to languish um, overly in our illness not to spend more than the appropriate time being unwell we may we need to it's our responsibility to to move from sickness to wellness as quickly and sort of efficiently in inverted commas as we like and so um, that culminates in the fourth point where there is an expectation that you seek help and that you seek competent help uh, and this is this is the other catch probably more for modern society actually than um, the society of, of the 50s that uh, that Parsons was talking about but the, the the idea that we seek competent help we go to a doctor you don't go to a quack you don't go to um, to an alternative medi medicine practitioner is effectively what what this is saying that if we we have a responsibility to be well um, we have to have a responsibility to seek our wellness through the appropriate uh, healthcare practitioner and this is a good example of how functionalism limits and is is conservative in in its um, aspirations about society but it also gives us a bit of an insight into how functionalism will sort of expand to to accept uh, new social movements and, and new ways of being in in if uh, homosexuality is always the classic that you know in the 50s it was taboo and in in the the noughties uh, when uh, what are we in now we're out of the noughties aren't we we're in the 10 teens aren't we yeah um, so um, now we, we're having the argument as I've referred to a number of times about gay marriage we've accepted that people are gay we're accepted that they live together and they have sex together and that's just fine and now we're trying to actually get them married in the same way that 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 heterosexual marriage so and that's that's in in a function functionalist sense reflecting surrounding values in terms of um, medicine and the the appropriate um, seeking of health care we've we've probably even in a functionalist sense accepted that alternative practitioners like uh, naturopaths homeopaths acu acupuncturists chiropractors all are, are now um, acceptable healthcare care broadly anyway acceptable health care practitioners that would allow you to fill the fourth constituent of of um, uh, Durkheim's sick role um, in moving from from ill health to to wellness as quickly and and efficiently as possible um, now there's the, the idea of the so there's the, the other thing I point you to is there's very interesting table 213 on on page 7 740 that I won't go into to detail there's a lot in this chapter and I, r I really recommend that you read this chapter 
carefully because it's not it it starts a, it may seem like a dry subject but it's really quite interesting to to understand the conceptualizations of of health and illness from a sociological point of view um, as distinct from what would be an everyday view of, of you catching something you you're going for treatment and you're getting better again and it's that simple um, the um, the, the table on, on page 740, which is the transformation of, of health and disease, looks at um, illness management, beliefs, demography, death, and what, what particular periods have been noted for. And then it divides the world into to particular periods of the traditional agrarian period, the industrial period, the modernizing period, the transitional period, and then the postmodern period. And these have been the key periods that I've talked about throughout the, the semester. Um, so and so this gives you an idea how the sociological imagination and the sociological approach can be overlaid in onto to many different sort of structural aspects of, of society. Um, so it may be interesting to to have a look at that. And just to give you a very brief example of it, um, when they when when we talk about death in a sociological context, um, in traditional agrarian societies, um, the the notion of death was simply as a natural occurrence. Um, the mysteries of death uh, in terms of, of biology weren't well known so even in my um, my grandmother's time people um, a lot of people died of cancer but but it, it wasn't necessarily termed as cancer it wasn't diagnosed in, in the same to the same extent in the same detail as it was people just um, certainly died of, of complications. Um, then in the industrialization period um, death moved to the home because it, like I was describing earlier the the home and the family became much more uh, a, a much stronger sort of social focus uh, and so so death was usually something that was was much more private and happened in the home. In the agrarian period death was much more public because also, as I explained, the, there was a, much, a greater community sense about what everybody did. Um, then they argue in the modern period, um, death occurs in hospitals. In this transitional period, we have this idea that I was mentioning last time, um, the notion of assisted death, of, of euthanasia. And then in the post-modern period, um, and a lot of you will have, have picked these things up, read them in newspapers, there's the idea of the approaching idea of immortality. Um, there was a wonderful, a wonderful um, um, medical journal article just well last week. I'm talking February, um, where they've created nano robot thingies that get injected to us. It's like there was a what was there was a show where people were injected into. Was a fantastic voyage. Okay, yeah, fantastic voyage. I've, I I only know about it. I'd never seen it, but but the idea that they were, people were injected into somebody's body, weren't they? And then there'd be some good bits to visit. <laughs> did they go to the good bits and the not so good bits? Or they, yeah, they did. Did they? <laughs> How did they escape? Oh, did they? All right, that's no fun. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is this is sort of the, this is fantastic voice sort of coming through. These nano robots are going in, and they'll be able to target um, cancer cells, um, and then then invite the T cells in to do the jobs on the cancer cells. It's quite remarkable, um, and there have been there have been lots of these advances. Um, I'm doing a bit of this, but it's we'll say advances in inverted commas because they're not actually delivered, and they're still so sorry. They're not actually delivered, but still subject to. Um, um, I'm not getting bored. <laughs> <laughs> uh, still subject to, um, to to lots of testing and, and clinical work before they'll they'll actually be a part of part of our treatment lives. But there 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 is the there's a the disgust the the discursive notion now in medical practice that if not immortality, a quite long life 
um, is a possibility. That is life that goes goes uh, quite a bit beyond a hundred years of age, which would have been inconceivable back in the traditional and the and the agrarian age. And even today, I mean, still the the remarkable thing I think about Australian society is I'm a 57 year old man, uh, obviously a white man, <coughs> yeah, middle class, reasonably well paid, don't smoke, drink, obviously. Well, why do I say obviously? Um, um, and live well, and exercise, and all that sort of stuff. And I'll be disappointed at the very least if I don't get another thirty years. If I was an indigenous man of this age, I'd be saying to count down to um, if you take the average um, of death coming to visit me in the not too distant future. This is in Australia today. We are the same biological human being, myself and the indigenous, indigenous man of my age, but because of life chances and because of the, the demographic and cultural circumstances we find ourselves in, there is an enormous difference in, in our, um, our mortality. <coughs> so um, I'd, I'd invite you to have a look at that to, to get an idea of, of, of how the um, how the understanding about various aspects of, of health and illness have evolved over those key key epochs that, that I've, I've discussed. Um, so there's also the idea of there is the, the social construction of treatment and the social construction of illness and the medicalization process of illness and the narratives of illness as well. Um, um, the the social construction of an illness is 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 sort of interesting and and it look it's it spreads far and wide and it's it's not simply um, it's not simply a case of um, uh, um, um, psychosomatic you know the the the, the somatization of illness but um, um, and it's it's interesting to see how it works in in these epochs as well. So you had the I, the the um, experience not so, so long ago of of RSI, and I suppose we still see our RSI a bit. But um, the shift to keyboards and the the amount of work we we've done on keyboards since this has happened has resulted in an explosion of RSI for a while. But RSI, so it's a, a sort of a social phenomenon um, and RSI has, has, has sort of receded in and similar to the sort of the ubiquitous um, dodgy workers back, you know, where, which I suppose many of you would have seen on those, those 6.30 shows on, on um, you know, I can do this, current affairs shows. Um, about people with with dodgy backs, which is also a manifestation of of sort of the social construction and and maybe even the social re re response to um, to illness as well. Um, one of the interesting uh, things that this the the textbook looks at um, is um, HIV AIDS. Um, uh, across the world and across time, and and the um, interesting look the, there, the the table on 747 is is particularly interesting because it, it breaks down across various countries um, and across various um, human categories the numbers and frequencies of of HIV AIDS. One of the interesting things um, phenomena that I've observed with HIV AIDS is in, in, in places like Australia, again in first world countries, um, our management of, of the HIV epidemic was, was very effective um, in, in bringing it under control very quickly um, with a concerted so a whole of community response after we, we sort of worked out what, what it seemed to be about. Um, the group in Australia that was affected, but this is not the universal, the group that's universally affected across the world, were, were gay men. Um, I point out that across the world, um, HIV AIDS is uh, as likely to be a heterosexual as it was a homosexual disease in Australia, uh, and likely to be visited on all age groups, um, but 
in in the eighties when it really exploded, it was young twenty thirty something men um, gay men ostensibly and and intravenous drug users um, to a lesser extent who were the uh, the main population who who contracted um, the the virus and then the the syndrome um, now one of the reasons I argue why the HIV AIDS was dealt with so so effective well a couple of reasons why we but the underpinning reason why is that that a very influential group in society was subject to this disease and that was white um, middle class men um, who were able to mobilise to mobilise power, to mobilise social organisations, to mobilise responses by, by governments and medical institutions and as a consequence were able to, to, to engender a response from, from the authorities um, to this condition, and once the authorities had realised the, the the potential dangers that the 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 disease had, the response was was quick, thorough, and um, and effective. Um, and getting back to what I was saying at the beginning of of the lecture, socioeconomic status and and power and authority are, are influential factors in getting good outcomes. Now, you would argue that the good outcome, relatively, um, uh, good outcome for the, the epidemic, if you like, rather than the individual cases, which, which were very sad, and I've had a couple of close friends die um, as a result of, of AIDS. So on the personal level, tragedy, but on the the um, epidemiological e e e level quite successful and and stopped what was a potential epidemic breaking out into into other other populations and this has been the problem across the the developing world that that hiv has been able to to get out of certain populations and 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 spread and um so uh if if it's this disease has become a, a problem for governments, a problem for sort of world governments um, um, over the last 20 or, or 30 years um, and has been dealt with um, with various successes and those successes you, you'd have to say are to do with with access, access, access to resources um, and, and um, government attitude so there, there have been African governments whose attitude towards this based on on what they wrongly perceived was was um, um, some retribution against against homosexuality and you'd have to say the 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 church hasn't hasn't aided um, that as well um, so that the the use of condoms for instance which are with the major frontline protection um, has been resisted um, by influential institutions like like the church um, and then certain governments and individuals in the the developing world and particularly Africa it seems um, have meant that has meant that the e epidemic has has become just that much uh, a, a quite serious uh, epidemic so um, dealing with 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 um, large-scale pandemics I suppose you, you you'd have to to describe it as it's um, it's not like the bird flus that we've had scares about over recent times which you'd have to say have been aided by globalization so um, what I mean by that is the, the 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 speed of connection we have throughout the world through um, so jet travel these days means that that um, uh, disease gets passed much more quickly than, than it has before. So, um, in terms of, of, sort of health and illness and, and their implications, um, um, sociology has a lot to say and probably a lot more than, than um, you would expect. So, um, it, it ends um, the the chapter ends with a um, a section on on death and dying and the um, um, how we've we've dealt with death um, how we've separated life and death and the processes 
uh, for some time and how now death has become, I mean, death is, is everywhere um, these days on our televisions. It's hard to avoid, avoid death, but on the, the, the personal level, death, death and dying in the, the modern era has been, been isolated to hospitals. Um, it hasn't been something that's been shared by the family in, in the domestic setting and then, then the community around it. Um, but there, there is an argument um, uh, at the end of the chapter about um, the importance of the return of death and our changing attitudes choose towards death, which is a sort of appropriate place to, to end the chapter on health and illness. So have a look at that. I think you'll find it much more interesting than, than, um, than you may, may have initially s thought when you, you, you saw the, uh, the heading in the, the subject outline. And I'll be back for the last one next week. Bye-bye. Swinburne Production.